surrendered, and we had these four big guns within a hundred yards away of this building. And one of the guys from the gun crew, he went out and he put one of these a shell in the gun and fired it off. And uh, first thing you know, the captain arrived, who was our big boss, and he demanded to know who fired the gun. No one would admit firing the gun. No one would admit it. Uh, and uh, he insisted. In the meantime, all Manila Bay is all being all lit up with fireworks from all the ships out there. They're all firing guns off like crazy. But this guy kept us down on the beach all night long filling sandbags because none of us would tell him who fired the gun. So that's how we celebrated the end of the war, filling sandbags on the beach all night long because this guy was afraid he'd get in trouble. I'm sure that's for the same reason. Anyhow, that's my... Everybody's getting kissed on Broadway and we're filling sandbags on the beach. That's the story of our life. How about the next day and the days that followed? What uh, what became apparent? What did you? What, what happened next? What happened in those? Well, well, there was. Uh, you know, people started talking about the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the big thing. There's a lot to talk about there. You know, what are you going to do when you get home? And uh, how's your life going to change? And it was going to change for everyone because, as you, as we mentioned earlier, some people had never been away from home before, and now they saw a lot of the things that go on in the world and they wanted to be a part of it and so people were thinking primarily of going off to school in different places and going to work in different areas but not necessarily going home to stay. Going home to visit but not necessarily to stay. But uh, it, it, was, it was a long time, it was a long wait between the end of the war and until the time we got a ride home. and. Uh, it was basically it was a pretty boring time. You were you remained in uh, Novotas for a while. Yeah. How long? Oh, until January, I believe, 1943. Either late December or January, uh, they were. Everyone was assigned. Uh, a number of points depending on your length of service and how mm -hmm. long you were overseas and so mm -hmm. forth. And depending on the number of points that you had, that was the, that's how they picked you to um, go home. So when, you're, uh, when your point number would come up, uh, you'd get a notification to, uh, to ship out and they took you someplace. We ended up up in the hills somewhere and, and uh, outside Manila, I can't tell you where it was, another staging area and we were there for a week or ten days or so before we got a ship to come home. And that would have been early 1946? 46, yeah. Um, and, and during the time, there, there wasn't a lot going on then in, in those months, uh, August to January, it was pretty quiet. Pretty quiet yeah. for you? Yeah. Not a lot yeah. going on. And your quarters, they were, they were tent or they were pretty quiet yeah. for you? Yeah. Not a lot yeah. going on. And your quarters, they were, they were tent or they were no, this was in the tin roof thing. That tin the roof, you described it, you yeah. managed to build, okay. Yeah, we had some guys that were okay. sharp enough to build these things. Okay, so you lived in that. So your quarters were adequate, you were able to get by. Food was always terrible, absolutely yeah. horrible, oh, horrible. Got a little bit better when the war was over in Europe. And then they released some uh, refrigerator ships to go to the South Pacific. Before that, we didn't have any. We lived on bully beef from Australia, mm. mutton from Australia, powdered eggs, powdered potatoes. We used to have uh, what we call battery acid, which was supposed to be lemonade, but it tasted like battery acid. It was some kind of a powder. So the food, food was adequate, kept you going, but it was not. Not, uh, not good. A lot better than the guys were getting that were living out in the field, I'll tell you that. You know, a lot better than eating K rations all the time. How were you, uh, how did you return home? 
How? Well, we had a troop ship once again, one of those 8,000 man troop ships in the general class. Uh, but it was a much happier ship, you know, knowing that we were on our way back. And uh, I can't tell you how long it took, but it was probably a week plus. You didn't have to zig and zag this time. No, no zigging and zagging. And uh, did you stay in s underneath, or did you stay? Uh, did you sleep so, on it? Same way that we went over. You, you try to sleep on deck if you possibly could. It was because it's it's never it was never very good sleeping down below, and you didn't have an opportunity to shower or anything. You know, <laughs> they, they did have salt water showers, I think, but that wasn't very good. Leave you itchy the rest of the time. I think they opened up uh, the shower, fresh water, for maybe maybe an hour a day, and that would be like at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. If you wanted to take a shower, you had to get up and get in there before anybody else did. But there wasn't very much. Food? Food Food was, 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 was pretty good on the troop ships. Yeah, yeah, I mean, especially coming home, it was pretty good. I mean, you know, considering we had much better food than we ever had in the era. In the Philippines, I mean, it, on the ships, it was reasonably good. The uh, seasickness. There was a lot of seasickness coming through the Straits of the Philippines. I guess it was San Bernardino Strait, they call it. Very, very rough water. Once again, everybody was sick. Like two days worth of sickness before things settled down. Where did the troop ship? Go to where did it finish? It's uh, it wasn't Oakland, but there's another town out there. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, sorry to say, it's pretty close to Oakland, and uh, we went into an army camp there. Once again, I can't think of the name of that place, but uh, the the the. Best sight I ever saw in my entire life, and I'll never forget it, was coming home on that ship. They announced that we will be in sight of San Francisco, and they announced the time. And on that ship, they announced that we will be in sight of San Francisco, and they announced the time in the morning, like five o'clock in the morning. So everybody made sure they got up and were out to sea, and and there was no fog. It was clear as a bell. And we could see all those hills with San Francisco with all the lights on it. And, and it was just, look, just like looking at paradise. We had finally arrived at paradise. You know, nobody thought they were going to get there. At least until 1948. Because everybody was, before the atomic bomb hit, everybody was saying, uh, you know, the saying over there was Golden Gate in 48. Huh. That's as soon as they expected to get back, if they got back at all. Uh, and one of the things that worried guys as much as anything was the sickness. There were so many guys getting sick, they thought they would never make it. So that's why that site was so glorious. Eric, they had similar where they had, where you described the fevers that you had. In the oh, there were all kinds of crazy things happening to people. Mm -hmm. Psychological mm -hmm. and physical. I bet you would have been really worried. There was an awful lot of it. I bet you it was hard. I bet you it was really hard. The so you came up the gold the the Golden Gate and then up to uh, the bay to, to near Oakland, and uh, and we went into a, a, an army camp where they treated us to uh, Thanksgiving Day type uh, dinner, where they had fresh milk and and turkey and beef, and they had everything you've ever want. and a lot of people couldn't handle it. You know, from being away so long and not eating for so long that they, uh, their stomachs couldn't handle all the goodies we had. And they ever, always remember they had, to, they had a lot of uh, Germans, German prisoners of war, working behind the counter handing out all this food. And these guys were happy as, as could be. They, they were living a pretty good life, you know. <laughs> but they were, uh, they were really happy at their work. So then after a couple of days at that camp, then we got aboard uh, another troop train. Now this was a real troop train. And we came home 
once again all the way back to Indian Town Gap, another five day trip. Uh, only the, this troop train wasn't as good as the first one I was on. This was the real thing and it wasn't very nice. But it was adequate. We were going home, so it was okay. Yeah, you it's, emotionally felt a lot better knowing you were returning home and not having to go out. You were in, um, what did you sit on? What did you stay in? in? On the troop train? Troop train, it was it was really basic. I mean, wooden benches and a, mm. a potbelly stove in the middle for heat. and. And I think that's how they eat food and on this pot belly stove. I don't know where they got these cars. They must have been sitting around for oh. an awful long time. Where, where was it? Was it the same train all the way across? Did you have to switch trains? No, we didn't have to switch trains. We stayed on that same train all the way by the the southern route down through Needles, California, and across the desert and up, I guess, through Phoenix, part of Texas, and so forth. The southern, of course, it was in the winter time. See, they don't oh, go the northern yeah. route in the winter time, or I guess it's too dangerous. Now, how many are, are, are scheduled to go to Indian Town Gap? Everybody on this train is, and there are. They? How many are, are, are scheduled to go to Indian Town Gap? Everybody on this train is, and there are. they yeah, from all, all different all batteries trains. and groups. Are they? From, are they? They're they're different divisions and units. These are guys from all over. There's the just an. Uh, just a, a gathering of all kinds of guys who were heading for discharge on the East Coast. And I guess they all went through Indian Town, at least from Pennsylvania, they went through Indian Town Gap. Were there any discipline problems on the way home that you recall? No, well, the discipline was kind of loose at this point. Yeah. And uh, no, things worked out very fine. Yeah. Indian Town Gap, what did you do then? What happened at Indian Town Gap? Well, they gave us another physical exam, which they were always doing, giving, giving you a physical, giving you another physical exam, and they, they gave you, a, they took away what clothes you had and gave you another army outfit and gave you a, a ticket on the train to Philadelphia. And they said, so long. They said, give you a piece of paper. That was it your, took about three days, I think. That was your discharging time right there at Indian Town Gap. Yeah. Gave you a hundred dollars. Yeah. Sent you home. And you arrived home. How long had it been since you had your communication with your family during this time period? Were you in communication? Pretty much, except when you were, when I was traveling on those uh, troop ships, you know, there was no way of communicating ship. there. And you wrote letters back from, yeah. from uh, the Philippines? They knew you were there? They knew where you were when you were? I don't know there? if they knew. Say, uh, I guess they did. Uh, all our letters were uh, censored, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they used to censor out all kinds of things that they felt that the folks at home shouldn't know. Mm -hmm. The if you were to describe the the if you in your mind the best experience, the best of it all, like 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 if there was something you'd never want to do again beyond being in the war because of your experience in the war, and something you would do again. If you could describe that to me, something that I would do again. You know, let me turn this off. I have no desire to go back to the. Film. No desire to go back there. Anything that was really that stands out in your mind that was that was remarkably good about your your time in the service. Something that you really. Uh, the the time I had at uh, at Fort Monroe, Virginia, was I, I enjoyed that. That was that was a nice place. And if you were going to pick out a place that was favorable. It was the time when I was on the cadre at the school down there at the Coast Artillery School. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I thought was the worst experience was the troop ships. That was, that was not good. Post-war experiences, uh, upon your return, did, did you take advantage of any of the GI Bill um, offerings? Uh, yes, I did. What did you do? Well, I went to night school. And uh, I went to St. Joe's. I was living in West Philadelphia then. I went to St. Joe's at night on some accounting courses. And since I had this uh, electronic background in the Army, uh, television was starting to come into, the, into its own at that time. 
and I thought that might be an opportunity there, so I switched over at one point to Temple. Temple had, and I thought that might be an opportunity there, so I switched over at one point to Temple. Temple had a technical school, and I had electronic training at Temple. Uh, but then as time went on, I saw that that wasn't, it wasn't for me for whatever reason. I was more in tune with uh, accounting and things like that. So I ended up going back to school uh, for the accounting and under the GI Bill. And that's how I ended up in my career really with the uh, IRS and all because I had to, they needed people with an accounting background. And so the GI Bill was, was a great thing. And yeah. the year that I came out of the service was the year my father died. So that kind of uh, shot out any opportunity to go to school uh, full time in the daytime. Because I was the oldest boy in the family and I felt as though that I should be around to, to help out with the finances. You know, back in those days things weren't as liberal as they are today with, with money. So anyhow, that's how I continued working and going to school at night. You feel that the war shaped your post-war life? Did you feel what? How how did it shape your post-war life? What did you? What changed for you? Well, I think everything changes when when you go through a war. Uh, you uh, you grow up very very fast. You go into service. There's no time at all. You're a, you're a changed person. You're a lot more serious, and you feel as though. Uh, you have a, a closer attachment uh, uh, to your country and and your government, and you're a little bit more serious about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think. Is there anything else you'd like to add that you can think of from your wartime experiences? Well, I think because I, I was in the service for a little over three years and I got away mighty easily in that three or four years compared to a lot of folks that uh, I feel as though we should avoid at all costs any involvement in warfare at all costs. You should go to the limit. You should 